Welcome to the HCI Family of Podcasts, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We share our own original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. Join us for practitioner-oriented content around all things leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with the HCI family of podcasts. Jake Thompson, welcome to the conversation today. Hey, John. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. It is a pleasure to be with you. You're joining us from Texas. I'm south of Salt Lake City in Utah. And today we're going to be talking about how to develop the right mindset for leadership. As we were talking about in the pre-interview, you know, this is something I think is always on the periphery of the topics I'm exploring with guests on this podcast, though I'm not sure we ever explicitly really just drill in on this specific topic. I'm really excited to talk uh, with you, Jake, today about this, to unpack this, and to really get your perspective on how important it is uh, to have the right mindset and what those mindsets can look like and how we can work towards developing them. As we get started, I wanted to share Jake's bio with everybody. Jake Thompson is a keynote speaker, published author, and leadership performance coach who has been featured in Forbes, Inc. magazine, and directly impacted over 80,000 people to date. His programs help ambitious leaders boost their performance and create better personal and professional skills to help teams gain a competitive edge in the marketplace. And I could go on. There's so many different things you've accomplished, Jake, in your career, but I'm going to pause there. Anything else you would like to highlight by way of your background or personal context before we dive on in? Yeah, no, I would say that probably fits best. The only other thing that I always love to to throw out is is proud husband and then dog dad to three rescues as well on the the personal side. Very good. And I have to ask, I have two dogs myself. What breeds? So sugar is my 11 year old boxer and then donut and snacks are our six year old and two year old Frenchies. Oh, wonderful. (laughs) Very, very good. I I have a soft heart for, for dogs. uh, So I always have to ask when that comes up. I was about to say mine hopefully won't make an appearance today because they're all sleeping, but we'll see. (laughs) (laughs) Very good. All right. Well, well, let's start with, uh, exploring, unpacking kind of the foundational pieces around this mindset, uh, idea. Um, and maybe we can start with how you got into the space and why you're doing work around mindset. Um, how did you get doing this work and why is mindset where you're focusing on? Yeah. So I would love to say that I had this planned out, this awesome vision that has just been self-fulfilling, but really I fell into this more than anything. I was a successful marketing consultant uh, in my 20s Uh, here in Dallas. I was working with global corporations on marketing strategy, content marketing, and was really unfulfilled with the work. And around that time, I was going through a life change of what do I actually want to do and build that's going to impact more than just me. It was really a total shift because in that, up to that point, I've been, how can I make as much money, have as much fun and have as many toys as possible? And I liken it to building an incredible sandcastle that was going to wash away. I was doing nothing mm-hmm. to make an impact beyond. And I'm all for building successful businesses, making a lot of money, having a great career. But when you do it for a selfish vein, you're going to find that it's pretty empty. And so I started exploring this idea of what would it look like to make a bigger impact At the time, I was probably 60 pounds heavier than I am now. And so I started just trying to rebuild physically. How do I get back to the old athletic Jake that that was growing up from high school and college? And so this idea of competing every day with myself started to really stand out. And as physical changes happened, people started to pay attention and say, hey, what are you doing? I was like, I'm just competing every day. That's me, me versus me. I've always been a learner. My mom was a elementary school teacher. So from the time I was like moving, she's like books in hand. And so I've always read, love to learn. And so I was really getting into psychology and a lot of the things around leadership, personal development, professional development as a way to try to figure out how do I actually do something bigger? How do I make a better me to go make a bigger impact? And along the way, as you start to get revealed with certain things, such as Carol Dweck's work uh, in the book Mindset on growth Mm -hmm. and fixed mindset, you start becoming aware of why you did certain things and were like, if I'd only done that differently. And for me, it was always looking back through the lens of sports of like, 
What would I have done differently if I had known this? Or if I hadn't seen discomfort as the enemy, but a growth opportunity. So I just continued to learn and would talk about it. The same time I launched Compete Every Day really as an apparel business. I was selling t-shirts out of the trunk of my car behind a CrossFit gym in Dallas, just as a side hustle next to my consulting. And the shirt started to take off. People started to latch onto this idea of competing every day with themselves. And so as it grew, I started looking for more and more opportunities to say, how do I actually teach this? It's cool to put on a shirt. It's great for a social media post, but how do you actually apply this mentality? And how do you do so in a way that you bring your best self and put in the work to be your best. So you bring your best to the people you care about or you work alongside. And so that went that way. And so years into that business, we made a strong shift of if we really want to help leaders become better leaders or managers transition into leaders or people who don't think they can lead, give them the tools to be able to effectively do it. We have to change the business. And so in 2017, we started shifting what we do uh, really from just an e-commerce brand to development of coaching. And, and a lot of my work as a keynote speaker today. And so that's really kind of where we got into this journey. And so it's a lot of what am I learning? What are we teaching? What are my clients experiencing? How are we coaching them? And then finding a way to package that because what I think happens is two really big issues that we see in a number of industries, from sales to construction to healthcare. One, we assume in a lot of senses that leaders are just naturally born. Like mm -hmm. you're just naturally a leader, you're naturally not. Second thing that we do is if you're not, we don't really train you, right? So we assume you either have the skills or you don't. And so when we promote you from a performer to a manager or from a manager up to a C-suite, we just kind of have the you'll figure it out mentality in a lot of industries. And what we're finding and what people are starting to realize is leadership is a skill set. There's some people that have more skills or natural abilities in certain areas than others, but it's still a skill set that can all be learned and developed given the right intentionality and practice. Yeah, all of that's awesome. Uh, and I completely agree. Uh, Carol Dweck's work, growth mindset, we can develop leadership skills. Uh, I, I do not believe in this idea that you have the, the great man leader kind of my, idea. Like that that's an old school kind of philosophy that, you know, people are born into leadership. And uh, now do, do certain people kind of naturally have certain leadership characteristics um, that help them to be more successful as leaders? Sure. You know, but, there, but all different types, you know, in different circumstances, different situations uh, can be successful as leaders and everyone I truly believe can develop themselves into successful leaders. And, and so I really appreciate how you highlighted all that. And as you started out, I really want to double click on this and, yeah. and highlight it. Cause I love how you focused on competing with yourself each and every day. Um, you know, it's fine to, you know, compete with those around you. It's fine, you know, to have goals. It's fine to, you know, whatever motivates you to get up and get going and, and uh, try to achieve, you know, great, you know, especially if you find yourself lacking motivation, whatever that spark is for you, great. Um, but I really love this idea of just competing with yourself because that's all that really matters. It, it, you know, it doesn't really matter what that person next door, that car that they have, it doesn't really matter, you know, the, the other people who have different positions and different titles, what matters is you, where you're at, how you're growing, how you're developing and, and you, you know, you, and you can challenge yourself and you know what you're capable of and you can push yourself in appropriate ways. And so I, I love that focus. Like you knew where you were at in high school and college, you knew what you were capable of in terms of like your body, physical health, and in, in terms of what you could get back to, you knew what you were capable of in terms of side hustle, in terms of your business, those sorts of things. Um, and, and you pushed yourself to get back to it. And that's, that's amazing, you know, and everyone is going to be a little bit different in that regard. And so let's stop comparing ourselves to everyone else around us and the trappings of what society tells us is what we should be achieving. And let's just focus on like competing with ourselves and just becoming a little bit better every day. You know, if I can be 5% better competing with myself every day, imagine how amazing I can become, you know, in six months or a year from now.
Yeah. And, and that's honestly why the idea of competing every day is for me, it's foundational to the work we do. It is literally what we build everything off of is because you have to have the mentality. It's you versus you. There's benefits to competing with others with the right mindset, right? If you yeah. understand the competition is with myself, then having someone in the office that, Hey, you're both competing for this goal in sales, or you're both, you're competing against another organization for top in your industry. There's a benefit because it's going to push you out of your comfort zone to keep pace. And that's helpful. The problem we run into is when we put our happiness and our self-worth in the hands of someone else. And we let that outcome that's 100% out outside of our control dictate our worth, our confidence, and our happiness. And that's why you talked about it's like somebody driving a nicer car. We know all the studies and research on happiness, right? There's no absolute. It's relative. And for most people, it's, am I doing better than my neighbor? Am I doing better than my friends? Not, am I being the best I can be? And I always think of that of like, if you were a kid, say you were in high school at 18 and you had the chance to be the best NBA player in the world, you were going to be the best, the next Michael Jordan, the next LeBron James. But instead of focused on being your best, all you cared about is making sure I was a starter on my high school team and better than that kid who's probably never going to play at college. Yeah. Your bar would drop because your effort would drop, your intensity, your focus, everything would drop to be just better than someone who's not even at your level. And so we run into that trap. And so that's kind of, for me, foundationally, why it's part of leadership is first and foremost, if we don't model the behaviors and the standards of excellence that we want others to live up to, it doesn't matter how convincing our words are. Like they're going to fall flat because our walk will always talk louder. And so we have to build the habit and routine of I'm in competition with myself. I'm putting in the work every day to improve because you ask any manager, any CEO, any entrepreneur, in six months, do you want the people on your team to do better work than they do today, the same or worse? Everybody's like, better. <laughs> cool. What are, you, what are you doing to do better work, to lead better? How are you being intentional instead of hoping you just improve over six months? And that really challenges a lot of people to be like, oh, I'm expecting it of them, but not of myself. And so we always start with that baseline of, of put your confidence, your happiness, and what you're doing to improve every day. Then we can start talking about leading others others because be modeling the behavior regardless of where you sit in an organizational chart or what your job title is yeah yeah so that that compete with yourself compete every day kind of mindset and mentality i love that are there other types of mindsets that you feel are really key that we need to develop as we're trying to be effective leaders yeah there, there's really probably two that tie right into that one of them you might not be able to see over my shoulder, but it's a couple of Ted Lasso Funko Pops. <laughs> I love Ted Lasso. <laughs> uh, yeah, huge Ted Lasso fan, right? But it's the the stay curious, not judgmental. Yeah. As leaders, yeah. it even ties into the competing with yourself from this curiosity of where am I going to get better today? What am I going to do to improve? Who am I going to learn from? And so the idea of constantly being curious is helpful. The last is, is ties in all of it, right? It's the growth mindset. It's the, where am I looking to be intentional with my improvements? Because I care more about my growth than my popularity. Because being a leader is making hard decisions. And it's sometimes upsetting people by making the right decision for everyone. And so you have to go into it with the mentality of like, I'm doing my best to be the best, to help us grow as the best, more than I'm just here to win approval. Because what happens is when you care about getting everybody to like you and being buddy-buddy with everybody, you avoid tough conversations. You refuse to give constructive or productive feedback because, well, what if they don't like me as much or they don't invite me to happy hour? Like there's all sorts of things that tie into it. And so the idea that you care about growth over popularity or looking perfect, you constantly stay curious and then you're looking for this opportunity to compete with yourself intentionally every day those are really foundationally where the conversation starts. And all of those things are very different than most of the conversations we have when you move from performer to manager, because then it's just about, hey, now these people report to you. Yeah, that stay curious piece. I mean, I love Ted Lasso and there's lots of, of um, different times that that shows up throughout the show. But yeah. the one scene that, sticks in my mind is Arts. the dart scene in the bar. Um, I don't, I don't know if that's the one that sticks in your mind. That but... is a hundred percent. The one that always sticks with me. <laughs> so for, for anyone in the audience today who, who hasn't watched Ted Lasso first, let me say, 
go get on it. Like that's yep. your homework. Go watch Ted Lasso. That show is amazing. I love that show. And there are so many great leadership lessons in that show. It's heartwarming. It's upbeat. Um, it'll make you think lots of great leadership lessons. It's an amazing show. I just love it. I, I can't, yep. you know, talk it up enough, but in this particular scene, so you have, you have this American like D2 football coach who goes to the UK is teaching or, or is coaching uh, a, a soccer team and a, a European football team. Uh, he's never coached soccer. He has, knows nothing about soccer. doesn't even know the rules. Um, and he's assigned, you know, he, he's given the chance to coach this team and he's literally chosen out of spite because the owner of the team um, is upset at her ex-husband. Now she owns the team. She wants to, to upset him. So she hires this guy who doesn't know anything about soccer to humiliate, to like run the team into the ground to humiliate her ex-husband. That's literally why he ends up as coach of this team. But it turns out he's an amazing coach. He's an amazing leader. And it doesn't even matter what kind of team he's coaching. He is just amazing at rallying people around him, getting people to work well together. And that's what the whole show is about. And it's awesome. So there's this one scene where he is playing, he's at, um, he's at this bar, this local bar uh, with, with the ex-husband who walks in and he's an epic prick. He's a jerk. And, uh, and he ends up going and playing darts with, with the ex-husband and it, I won't spoil the whole thing. Go, go search it up on YouTube. It's amazing. Um, the, the punchline is stay curious. And, and he goes into this kind of whole soliloquy about the importance of staying curious and how he learned that lesson from his father, blah, blah, blah. Um, it's powerful. It's a, an important lesson. And yes, if we can ask questions, listen hard, stay curious, that is one of the most important things that leaders can do. It's illustrated in the show, Ted Lasso. I think we can all think of leaders who have done that effectively in our lives. And I think we can all think of leaders who have not done that effectively in our lives to detrimental outcomes. <laughs> yeah. Without, and that, so two things there that I think are really important for listeners. It's like, how often are we listening to our teams and our people for their input? Or is it always, I'm always right? Is it yeah. I'm always right or that's right, right? How do we separate it? The other piece that you said there that I think a lot of people miss with Lasso, he had the leadership skills, but lacked the technical skills. But because he had the leadership skills, he could learn the technical skills. They surrounded him with a team that did. And by the end, like he's learning pieces, but he's also empowering his coaches to call plays, to help design strategy. One of the things I think we miss when elevating people within our organization is we put way too much emphasis sometimes on the technical and underestimate the the leadership or the interpersonal. Because mm -hmm. sometimes sales organizations are a beautiful example. We promote our best salesperson and we wonder why they flop as a manager, as a sales manager, without realizing it's two completely different skill sets. And so what I continue to talk to clients about and, and what I've seen done successfully is you need some base on the technical side, but you can learn a lot of that. But if you're an individual who can coach, manage, and develop people, you're invaluable to an organization. And so if you can find those people that can connect, manage, and coach, which coach is a great replacement word for leader, because yeah. that's really your job. Manage is task-oriented. Leadership is developing people, coaching people up. It changes how your organization shows up. And to your point, like binge Ted Lasso. Because there is illustration on illustration of what it looks like to connect, to deal with conflict, to make a mistake and own it. All of the things that are crucial to being an influential leader. Yeah. And just one more highlight from that show. I I, I don't, this is not a Ted Lasso podcast. So <laughs> <laughs> we should, that, we can that, submit that's it for not one. a bad I idea. So. That, that would be a fun <laughs> podcast. But, um, but one of the things he does so well and, and I think if we all think about like the greatest leaders we've ever had, they've probably all done this also, is he, like this idea of stay curious, he truly would be present with everyone around him and he would stay curious and he would get to know everyone around him. Like he, he would, it, it didn't matter if it was like the towel boy guy or if it was like the person, the security person, the person at the front desk, the person at the restaurant, it literally 
everybody, everyone had value. Every he saw the innate value in everybody. He treated everyone um, as a person of value, and that matters, right? And and when he stays curious and he treats people that way, um, amazing things happen. Uh, yes. And I mean that in and of itself is one of those things. Like if you want to bring people together, create a sense of belonging, create a common sense of purpose, draw out the technical skills that people have that you don't have, it starts with that kind of behavior. And that's something that he just did so well. And one of the reasons why he's such an endearing character, right? Yeah, it's it's funny. One of the more, I laugh, uncomfortable moments in one of our keynote programs is when I ask people, You've worked with your coworkers a year, two years, five years. Some of you all been together 10 years. Can you tell me if your coworker has kids, is a dog person or a cat person, <laughs> what they like to do outside of work? Like, but every single one of you can tell me what email they owe you or what project they're behind on. Like we yeah. can tell you that, but we don't know the person. And we wonder why we have so much conflict. And so when organizations, especially leaders and people at the top invest in the relationships, it shows throughout. And there was a client, one of my clients I worked with years ago, their company ended up getting acquired. And this specific VP had about 80, 85 people on his team between a couple of levels. And so when the new, the new acquiring company had, you know, a couple of times they'd met and they said, Hey, come in for a meeting on Monday. This is Friday afternoon. And he said, okay, what do I need to prepare for? The VP's asking. And the, the head of the CEO said, just know your people. And so Monday he rolls in, he goes into to their offices. They hand him his org chart. So his division's org chart. And they say, tell us about your people. Not their roles, tell us about them. And he was like, he loves this because he is invested in his people. And so he went through and talked about every single person in his organization. And I asked him, I said, well, what was that like? He was like, I mean, I know my people. Like I was like, this is ace the test. I said, no, but what did that signal to you from them, the new people that you're just now learning that have acquired this organization? He said, oh, it told me they care about the people Mm -hmm. because they know at the top, they can't touch everybody. And so I have to be able to touch everybody on my team because they're going to influence me and the one below me. And I said, that makes a special organization. And so it goes back to that curiosity. What can I get to know about you? How can I develop you? What can we learn together that we get very distracted by deadlines and projects and PLs and all of the other pieces. But at the end of the day, it's the people that do the work that help us get the winning results. And so how do we invest in the people? Yeah, absolutely. It's the people that do the work. Now, all those other things you just mentioned, they do matter. Like we do have deadlines. Yeah. There is work that has to get done, but it is the people that do the work. And so, so we're not saying you know, it's not just all fluffy kumbaya. Let's just all feel good. We don't have to worry about getting stuff done. That's not what we're saying. Um, but if, if, if we can invest in each other, uh, work effectively collaboratively together, uh, empower each other, guess what? We're going to do the work better. We're going to get stuff done better. We're going to be more creative, more innovative. We're going to produce better, more higher quality stuff. We're going to bring better value to the market. All of that's going to be better, right? So we're going to have better outcomes and the people are going to be happier. They're going to be more satisfied, more engaged, et cetera. So, I mean, it's just, it's a no brainer yet. We get so distracted by it because we, we, we end up focusing on the PNL. We end up focusing on the deadline. We end up focusing. So we're looking at the end instead of focusing like on the, how we interact with the people who are doing the steps to get to the end. Uh, and we what we end up often doing, whether we intend to or not, is we end up chewing through all of the people that we rely on to get to the end results. Um, and you can do that to an extent in the short term and get to results, but in the long term, it's not sustainable. And you'll chew through people, um, you'll use up people, people will not be committed and loyal. Um, and that's why you have uh, quiet quitting. That's why you have high turnover. That's how, why you have all of these different types of things that make it hard for organizations. Um, so let's just in, like, as you know, when I think of a, a mindset for leadership, I think of, uh, you know, making sure that you, you know, having a people first mindset, having uh, uh, 
uh, an employee centric mindset is, is one of those things that I think is really important. And again, it doesn't mean that you're not focused on results. Results oh. are important. The organization doesn't exist if you don't have results and you don't have any people if you don't have results, but you also don't have any results if you don't have people. Right. That's and so exactly you have right. to make sure that you're always focusing on that people piece. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. You know, it's, it's the both. It's the balance, right? It's not this giant kumbaya. Like I think about the best coaches I had and they're going to teach me. They're also going to get up my tail if I make yeah, it, like yeah. get onto it. Like they're going to hold me to a standard. And so we've got to have that balance because in today's world with technology, what it is, with everybody looking for high performers and top talent, people have more flexibility on who they for. They're going to choose the environments they want to work in and high performers are not going to stay in places where they don't feel appreciated, where they don't get feedback and they don't see opportunity to grow and develop. And they're going to leave. And we know the cost of replacing employees from recruiting to onboarding, all of that adds up. And so why not influence some of the things in our control, which is creating that environment where we are people focused on how do I give you feedback? Not just where you mess up, but what you're doing well. How do I create rhythms where we're coaching and developing you, giving you opportunity? In fact, the one of the studies we I saw recently, 71% of people between 2021 and 2023 that left their job without another one in hand did so because the manager they reported to didn't give them feedback or didn't let them feel that they were appreciated. I was like, that's a solvable problem. So to your point, we've got all of these things going on in the world the one thing we can control is how we give feedback and how we coach and develop our people. And that becomes a real competitive advantage when people have a lot more say on where they work and what they do these days than they've ever had in history. Yeah. Yeah. Well said, Jake, this has been a fascinating conversation. It's, I love it. We could go all day, but I also know the time and I probably need to let you go here in a few minutes. Um, before we wrap things up, I just wanted to give you a chance to share with the audience how they can connect with you, find out more about your work, your team, uh, and then give us a final word on the topic for today. Yeah, best place to connect with me is going to be our website, jakeathompson.com. Uh, you can check out our podcast or my book, Lead Better Now, which is truly designed for people stepping into that leadership role that want to know how do you compete with yourself? How do you connect and coach up your team? Um, and then I hang out on LinkedIn. So would love to connect with you on there. Super easy on it. When it comes to leadership, kind of final thoughts, this is the one thing I start in the book and I love to emphasize. It's not your fault if you weren't trained on how to lead. Yeah. Most of us weren't. It is, however, 100% your responsibility if you decide to develop yourself as a leader or pass the buck to someone else. And so I hope by you listening to the podcast, it means you've invested in yourself to learn, to grow, to develop. So how can you invest this week in your people to better lead them? I love it. Jake, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. I encourage the audience to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Jake and his team can do for you. Check out the book, check out the resources. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe. They can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the podcast. We hope you stay healthy and safe and please join us again soon.